So on the board I have an equation for 16 times cosine of 2 pi over 17. It's negative 1 plus the square root of 17 plus the square root of 34 minus 2 square roots of 17 plus 2 square roots of 17 plus 3 root 17 minus root 34 minus 2 root 17 minus 2 root 34 plus 2 root 17. So this was discovered by Gauss in 1796 when he was 19 years old. And it represents the first major advance in constructing regular polygons since Euclid. So recall what Euclid discovered. Euclid, very first thing in the elements, you know, one of the first propositions is he shows you can construct a regular triangle, an equilateral triangle, a triangle where the sides and angles are congruent to each other. And, and of course, you know, it doesn't take much work then to also build up and construct a regular foregone, what we would call a square, sides and angles all being equal. Well, what else can you construct? If, if you have a triangle, then you can think about this triangle as being inscribed in some circle. And if you construct a regular three-gon, a regular polygon of three sides, what else would you be able to construct? Yeah, you can, you can just partition each of these sides, find the midpoint on each of these. So find the midpoint and then maybe send the ray out from the radius through that midpoint. And, and that will give you then six equally spaced points on the circle. And that gives you then a way to construct the regular six gun. But once you know you can construct a six gun, then again you can just bisect all the sides and you can cover a 12 gun or a 24 gone and so forth. So, so once you know you can get the equilateral triangle, you can actually construct anything of the form 2 to the k times 3. You can construct any 2 to the k times 3 gone. Similarly, once you know you have the square, you can construct any, you know, if you want to construct the regular octagon, you just think about this as living inscribed in a, in a circle. You bisect each side. find the corresponding points on the circle, and then you can construct your regular octagon. Or if you want to construct your regular 16 agon, you can bisect those sides, or you want to construct the regular 32 agon, so forth. So you can construct any 2 to the k times 4 dot. And then in book 4, Euclid gives us a way of constructing the regular pentagon. So this is a regular five-sided shape where all of the sides are congruent and all of the angles are equal. And once you know you can construct that, then you can say, okay, let me just bisect each of these sides, find the corresponding points on the circle, and then you have 10 equally spaced points on the circle, which gives you the regular 10 gone. And likewise, you can bisect those to get the regular 20 gone and so forth. So you get anything of the form 2 to the k times 5. And in some ways, the, the regular pentagon is like the crowning achievement of the first four books of Euclid's elements. But Euclid was able to extrapolate a little bit more. He actually he, he found a way to, to go from the 5 gone to the regular 15 gone. So, so this was what he did in, in book four of the elements. He said, not only can we get the 5 gone with five equally spaced points, but he found a way of actually getting 15. 15 equally spaced points on the circle, or a construction that would yield the regular 15 gone. So this is a 3 times 5. And once you have the 15 gone, you can recover the 30 gone, and the 60 gone, and so forth. So you can get anything over the form 2 to the k times 3 times 5. 
And so this was the fourth century BC. This is, this is Euclid. This is our fourth century BC. And then we call in the 1600s, we get Descartes coming along. And Descartes just gives us a new way of looking at what Euclid had done. Because Descartes says, well, we call constructing a number alpha from, from straight edge and compass. So alpha being able to be constructed. So like some length alpha being constructed by straight edge and compass. is equivalent to alpha being obtained by times divide plus minus and square root from rational numbers. And then we, we thought about this already a little bit, about how that actually can give you things like the constructability of these we can recover, right? So, so how do we know that, how do we know that the, uh, the, the, the regular three-gon, the, the equilateral triangle is constructible? Well, we would say that some angle alpha, so a corollary of this is some angle alpha is constructible. exactly when you can construct the values cosine alpha and sine alpha from just plus times, uh, from plus minus times divide and square root. Right, so, so it's when these are, are constructible. And so Descartes would say, well, you know, of course you can construct something like the, the regular 3-gon, because in a regular 3-gon, you can think you have your circle. In order to get three equally spaced points, all you have to do is you have to figure out some way to construct this angle right here which is 2 pi divided by 3. Yeah? But, but then he's like, but we know what cosine of 2 pi over 3 is. Cosine of 2 pi over 3 is, well, now you have to go back and remember the, the unit circle, but it's like, okay, if it was pi over 3, it's a little bit taller than pi over 6, so that's up at, at 1 half, so when it's 2 pi over 3, it's minus 1 half. And and that's something you can get from just plus, uh, minus, times, divide, and square root, right? Well, I just did cosine, but, but once you get cosine, you know you can get sine as well, because cosine and sine are related just by the relationship that cosine squared alpha plus sine squared alpha is 1. So if you have cosine, you can cover sine just using these operations. There'd be a square root involved, though, which is why the sine of uh, 2 pi over 3 has a square root in it with 3 over 2. OK. But, but here's the idea. You can construct an angle exactly when you can construct cosine of alpha. And so for general n-gon, when can we construct a regular n-gon? Well, we'll be able to construct that regular n-gon exactly when you're able to construct cosine of 2 pi divided by n. Yeah. That is, cosine of 2 pi divided by n is something you can get from just adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, and taking square roots of things that come from rationals, and then doing that. You know, maybe square roots of things that came from, from those. So when, when Gauss comes on the scene at the age of 19 <laughs> and shows that, well, cosine 
of 2 pi over 17 is just 1 16th of minus 1 plus root 17 plus root 34 minus 2 root 17 and, and on and on and on. What he's really doing is he's just proving that the regular 17 gone is constructible. There's some way to do it. Now, Euclid could have figured this out without this algebraic description. Euclid could have been very clever with his compass and straight edge and actually figured out what the construction looks like, right? But, but it's uh, a little bit tricky, <laughs> maybe suggested by the fact that the algebra is a little bit messy, right? So what I want us to do today, rather than just give you the construction, is I want to try to explain how Gauss figured this out. Right? Because like this is 1796. So he didn't have rule from alpha. You know, he didn't have a, a computer algebra system where he could just type in cosine of 2 pi over 17. He actually had to like do this by hand. And so I want us to figure out how he figured out that cosine of 2 pi over 17 is constructible. And to do that, I want to take a moment to talk about something called roots of unity. <laughs> So consider the expression x cubed minus 1 is 0. What are, the, what are the solutions to this? And you might be like, well, one solution is just 1, because 1 cubed minus 1 is 0. It's like, good. What are, what are the other solutions to this? Not minus 1, because if you plug in minus 1, minus 1 cubed is still minus 1. And minus 1, minus 1 is minus 2, so that doesn't give you 0. So, so what are the solutions to this? Well, you might think about knowing that 1 is a solution is saying that you can factor out an x minus 1 piece from here. And so you like, what are you left with if you factor out x minus 1? And you'd be left with just x cubed, plus, uh, x squared, plus x, plus 1. Yeah? And so like, take a second to convince yourself that this is what you have. So like, if you think about this, it's like x times all of this is x cubed plus x squared plus x. Then when you minus 1, you're minusing the x squared, minusing the x, minus 1. And things cancel even with just the x cubed minus 1. Yeah? OK. And so one of your roots, the root x equals 1, corresponds to this factor. But like, what are your other roots? Well, a quadratic equation kicks in, you know, like the other roots will just be x equals negative 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared 1 minus 4ac, so minus 4, all over 2a, all over 2. Ah, here I have a square root of a negative 3. So I'm going to have some imaginary roots here. That's fine. So I can write this as negative 1 half plus or minus i root 3 over 2. But wait a second. Negative 1 half and root 3 over 2? These numbers are familiar. We just talked about those numbers in the context of these points. Right? We're talking about cosine and sine. Our cosine of 2 pi over 3 was negative 1 half. Our sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. So there seems to be some relationship between the cosine of this angle and our roots. What's going on here? Well, you can just think about the unit circle in the complex plane. And since I'm in the complex plane, if I'm just at this point right here, this would just be the value 1, 1 plus 0i. And I think about what happens if I do an angle of 2 pi over 3. So here I'm going to come on out and do an angle of 2 pi over 3. It gives me this point right here, whose x value we said is minus 1 half. 
then whose y value is, is root 3 over 2, so it would be up on the, on the uh, imaginary axis plus i over 3 over 2. But our solution was plus or minus, so let's also plot the point down here. That's minus 1 half minus i root 3 over 2. What does that point correspond to? Well, if you just took another copy of this angle, another copy of the angle 2 pi over 3, you would land down here. In general, when you have a unit circle in the complex plane, and you at some point with angle theta, the coordinates of that point are just cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. You may have seen this abbreviated as e to the i theta. If you haven't seen this before, this might seem kind of a strange notation, but there's a couple of reasons it makes sense. First of all, if you do the series expansion for e to the i theta, it's the same as doing these two series expansions and adding them. So this is like a calculus two way of seeing this, right? Another reason it makes sense is because if you square this value, so maybe I won't write it here, but I'll just write it down here. If you happen to square cosine theta minus i sine theta, if you raise it to the second power, you can show you end up with cosine of 2 theta plus i sine of 2 theta. I mean, just do it out, see what you get. Do some trig identities. And so, so that naturally corresponds to the idea that e to the i theta squared should just be e to the i times 2 theta, right? So, so this is a natural way of representing the information. More generally, when you raise this to the nth power, you just recover cosine of n theta, sine of n theta, which corresponds to just multiplying theta by n. So if you take some value here, and you square this value, you'll just be landing at the corresponding value here, which corresponds to 2 theta. That's the same thing as this value squared. But now that we understand this, we can understand why these are the three solutions. OK, so why is this one of the roots well, we already said one is a root. That one's obvious. But why is this a root? Why is the solution to x cubed minus 1 equals 0? Or equivalently, x cubed is 1. Well, what happens when you cube this guy? You're just changing the angle from 2 pi over 3 to cubing it makes an angle three times as much. So it'll move it here to 1, right? What happens if you cube this guy? Well, this was the angle, a total angle of 4 pi over 3. And so when you cube it, where do you land? Well, you'd be going around to 4 pi, which takes you back here as well. And so these are the two points when cubed land at 1. The two points when cubed, their angle gets tripled and lands you at 1. More generally, if I want to find the nth roots of unity. That is, I'm looking for solutions to the equation x to the n minus 1 equals 0. Those would just correspond to, well, let's think. Yeah, there'll be one of them at 1. But there'll be one of them right here, where this angle is just 2 pi over n. Because what happens when I, when I cube that point? Well, cubing it would take me back to 1, right? And then I argue there'd be another one 
that's right here with an angle corresponding to 2 pi over n times 2, so 4 pi over n. Why? Because when I take this to an nth power, when I plug it in for x, take it into the nth power, I would just end up with 4 pi, which lands me back at 1 as well. And more generally, I'll just get all of these points spread out along here with angles of the form 2 pi k over n, where my k goes from 1 to n. Another way of saying that is that if I happen to call this first point something like omega, the second root of unity will just be omega squared, omega cubed, omega to the fourth, all the way to omega to the n, which is just one. So this will just have to factor as x minus omega times x minus omega squared times x minus omega to the n, where this last term is secretly just an x minus 1 factor. Yeah? So like, like think about it with an expression you're familiar with, right? Like think about it for something like, what, what is x to the fourth minus 1? What are my fourth roots of unity? Well, you know, you can do it algebraically or you can think about it geometrically. Algebraically, you would say this just factors as x squared minus 1 times x squared plus 1 is 0. That corresponds to x minus i times, oh, sorry, x minus 1 times x plus 1 times x minus i, because it's a plus 1, times x plus i is zero. And so, what are my roots here? They'll just correspond to the values plus one and minus one, plus one and minus one, plus i and minus i, plus i and minus i. Notice it's four points equally spread out along the circle. And I call this one i. The first one is just i. Notice if I square that first value, it takes me to the second value. i squared is just minus 1. And then if I take that i and I cube it, it gives me the next value, i cubed, which is just minus i. And I take that i and I raise it to the fourth, I get the last solution, which is just i to the fourth, which is negative 1 squared, which is positive 1. So the first root of unity generates the rest, just by taking powers of it. Are we, are we happy with this? Yeah? Is this familiar, or is this, this is not familiar? Okay. So you may have seen this before. I don't know if you had an ambitious high school teacher, or if you're taking complex analysis or something. This is how algebra should be taught in high school, right? But, um, yeah. Okay, great. So the last thing I'll say about roots of unity, well, well, let's just think about this. Let's think about this general case. What happens if I sum all the roots of unity together? What would be omega plus omega squared plus omega cubed all the way through omega to the n minus 1 plus omega to the n, which is, which is 1, right? What happens if I sum them all together? Take a second and, and think, what, what, do you, what do you think the sum of all those should be? You might want to just do the simpler case where there's just four of them. What would be the sum of those four? Yeah, just zero. In general, the sum is just zero. Why? Well, there's two ways to think about it, maybe three or four ways. One is these are equally spaced among the circle, right? And so there's a, there's a symmetry going on here. And so you can be like summing them, which is like finding the center of mass of these points equally spaced among the circle. And they'll have to be in the center. 
It can't favor one part of the circle more than another. You know, it can't pull it here, or pull it here, or pull it here, because they're equally spaced. There's nice symmetry to how they spread out. That's a more geometric way of seeing it. Uh, if you want to think about it in terms of algebra, just think, well, when I, when I multiply these together, and I'm just like foiling it out, multiplying all these terms together, you know, you get an omega times x times x times x, so you have as a coefficient to x to the n minus 1. So if you look at the coefficient of x times n minus 1, there'll be an omega there. But there will also be a omega squared times all the other x's, so plus omega squared, and so forth, so plus omega to the n. So you end up with, with this as your coefficient to x to the n minus 1. But you know when you multiply them out, you just get x to the n minus 1. So there is no coefficient to x to the n minus 1. The coefficient is just 0. So there's another way you can think about why multiplying these out have to give you this coefficient to x to the n minus 1. But we said it multiplies out to x to the n minus 1. So the coefficient is 0. OK. Either way, you prefer to think about it geometrically or algebraically, the sum is 0. Or the way we're often going to use the fact in, in our argument Today is we're going to say if you sum all of the ones other than 1, you get minus 1. OK, good? Great. So let's now come back to Gauss's construction. How was Gauss able to figure this out? What we're going to do is we're going to think about the 17th roots of unity. And so if you draw a unit circle in the complex plane, you've got this guy at 1, and then we have 16 other ones equally spaced out. So you end up with like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. Something kind of like that, kind of like that. OK. We want to think about constructing these. And so what Gauss's challenge really is, is can I, can I, you know, can, can I construct this? So let me give this guy a name. I'm going to call this guy Z. And, and we know secretly Z is of just the form cosine of 2 pi over 17 plus I sine of 2 pi over 17. And as we go along, we have Z squared, Z cubed, Z to the fourth, Z to the fifth, z to the 6th, z to the 7th, z to the 8th, z to the 9th, z to the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th, and then 1, which is the same thing as z to the 17th. Although it would be convenient for us to often think about z to the 16th as z to the minus 1 and z to the 15th as z to the minus 2. I mean, after all, since z to the 17th is just 1, we're essentially working mod 17 here with our exponents, right? So z to the minus 1 is z to the 16th, and so forth. z to the minus 3 is z to the 14th. What we're going to do is I'm going to define three quantities. We're going to define alpha to just be z plus z inverse. So, so why would you define alpha this way? Well, one way to think about it is z and z inverse have the same x value, right? So, so both would have cosine of 2 pi over 17 as its x value, because cosine of a negative angle is the same as cosine of a positive angle. But the signs would be opposite. The y values for these guys are opposite. These are symmetric over the x-axis. So if you add z and z inverse, what's going to happen, the i sine piece will cancel, cancel and you're left with just 2 times the cosine piece. So z plus z inverse is secretly 2 times cosine 
of 2 pi over 17. And so instead of showing that we're going to be able to construct two cosine, uh, uh, this cosine of 2 pi over 17, we're actually going to argue that we can construct alpha. But in order to construct alpha, we're first going to construct some other things. We're going to argue that we can first get beta, which I'll define to be z plus z to the fourth plus z inverse plus z to the minus fourth. And before we can get beta, I'm going to argue we can construct gamma, which will define to be z plus z squared plus z to the fourth plus z to the eighth plus z inverse plus z to the minus two plus z to the minus four plus z to the minus eight. In particular, what Gauss did is he argued that if you extend Q by gamma, you had a degree to extension. And then extending Q by beta is in fact a degree to extension of extending Q by gamma. And finally, extending Q by alpha is just a degree to extension of extending by beta. And so the way we end up getting an expression for alpha is we first show that we get an expression for gamma. The gamma is a solution some quadratic in Q. And then we show that beta is a solution to some quadratic in Q extended by gamma. And then we're going to show that alpha is a solution to some quadratic in Q extended by beta. And then that'll give us that alpha is a degree 8 extension of Q. And in fact, we'll have this expression for alpha that shows that alpha is extendable. So we're going to build up to this expression like one piece at a time. OK, so I don't know how much of what this proof we'll be able to do. But, but let's try to you know, at least get started on it and, and give an idea for how it works. So, so let's go back to thinking about gamma. So, so we have our gamma down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define some notion of a complement of gamma. I'm going to define gamma prime to be a sort of complement of gamma, which it's going to be all the powers I didn't include here. So I had 1, 2, 4, and 8 in their inverses. So what am I missing? Well, I'm missing 3. I'm missing 5 and 6. I'm missing 7 and their inverses. So why would I be interested in gamma prime? Well, two things to note. The first is if you do ga uh, uh, gamma plus gamma prime, that gives you all the powers of z. Well, except z to the 17th. You don't have one, but you have all of these other powers of z filled out, right? Your gamma just included these powers, 1, 2, 4, 8, and their inverses, 1, 2, 4, 8. And then your gamma prime just gave us the other ones. Gave us these other powers, and then their corresponding inverses. So what happens when we add them all together? Yeah, if we added everything together with the one, we get 0. Since we haven't included the 1, we just get negative 1. So we know these sum to negative 1. Then you can ask, well, what happens if I do gamma times gamma prime? If I multiply them together, it becomes a mess, right? What do I have to do? I have z times all of those terms. And so that would be like, you know, a, a z to the fourth plus a z to the sixth plus a z to the seventh, on and on and on. And then I have to do z squared times all these terms. And that'll give me like a z to a fifth plus a z to a seventh plus a z to the eighth, on and on and on. And you keep doing it. 
So you have these eight terms here, each times by these eight, you get a total of 64 terms here. But you look at those 64 terms, and you notice something happens. In those 64 terms, you can rearrange it where it's just four copies of z plus z squared plus z cubed all the way up to z to the 16th, which is z minus 1 as well. So it's really remarkable. You should rearrange the terms. The, the multiplication works out just right to get this. And then you say, well, that's just minus 1. So you really just have minus 4. So we have these two awful values, gamma and gamma prime. We have no idea what gamma or gamma prime are. But they add up to just minus 1, and they multiply to minus 4. What that tells us is it tells us that gamma and gamma prime are actually just roots of the rational polynomial x squared. So, so what are they roots of? They're the roots of, you know, they're roots of x minus gamma times x minus gamma prime, but that multiply out to just be x minus gamma plus gamma prime x, and then you would end up with a plus gamma times gamma prime, right? But we see that these are nice values. This is just gamma plus gamma prime is minus 1. So this is x squared plus x. And gamma times gamma prime is minus 4. This is rational. These are rational coefficients. Right? I mean, we can actually find the roots of this guy. <laughs> what are the roots of this guy? This guy just has roots. You know, your x, so hence your gamma and your gamma prime, must just be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, so that's plus 16, all over 2a. So your roots here are just negative 1 plus or minus root 17 over 2. Well, there are really two roots there. One is negative 1 plus the square root of 17 over 2. That's a positive number. The other one is negative 1 minus the square root of 17 over 2. So which one is gamma and which one's gamma prime? Well, let's go back and think. Gamma was the sum of the values we had circled, right? Notice they come in pairs, which means that the imaginary parts were cancel. The sign parts were cancel. The y values all cancel. So the y value of gamma is 0, right? the, 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 the imaginary part. So it's just a, 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 a real number. And would the real number be positive or negative? When you, when you add up the x values of all these guys, will it be positive or negative? Positive. There's a lot more stuff over here you're adding up than just this little bit over here, right? Like if you add up this x value with this x value with this x value, and then you subtract off that x value, well, it's still going to be positive, right? So I think just by eyeballing it, you can see it. You can check if you want to do like a loose check. But, but just by eyeballing it, I think it's pretty clear, your gamma has to come out to be this positive thing, which means the gamma prime is just the negative. So sure enough, you know, why is this a degree Q2 extension over Q? Well, gamma is just, you just need a root 17. That's the only thing you're missing, right? Q extended by gamma is really the same thing as just Q extended by root 17. Because once you have root 17, you can you subtract 1 from it, divide by 2. You can recover your gamma. So, so these are really equivalent. So what are we going to do next? Well, next we want to argue that we can find beta as being a root of a quadratic whose coefficients only have rational numbers and root 17s. Right, so this one, we got gamma to be a root of something that just had rational coefficients. Now we're going to show that beta is the root of some polynomial that has coefficients in this field that are both rationals and maybe some root 17s in there. So, so let's think about it. And Gauss is doing this all when he's 19. <laughs> it's because he didn't have Netflix, right? 
Okay, so here we go. We're looking at um, Q extended by beta. So recall beta was defined as Z plus, this is my 17th root of unity, plus what Z to the fourth where he said, plus Z to the minus one, plus Z to the minus four. And so let me define a complementing guy called B prime. And I'm going to define B prime to be the extra stuff you have to throw in to recover gamma. Right? So, so like what's missing? You know, I have here my z piece and my z to the fourth, my z to the minus one and minus four, but I'm missing the two and the eight. So let me define B prime to be z squared plus z to the eighth plus z to the minus two plus z to the minus eight. So like, why am I doing this? Well, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to think about this polynomial x minus beta times x minus beta complement, beta prime. Well, that's just going to be x squared minus beta plus beta prime x plus beta prime x and then plus beta times beta prime. But what is beta plus beta prime? Well, the way I've defined it, I've defined it so that my beta plus beta prime is just equal to gamma. And our goal, remember, is to try and get, write this b as a root to some, beta as a root to some polynomial coefficient in q and gamma. And so then the last thing we need to check is when you ask, well, what is beta times beta prime? Right? And so you can do that out. You can be like, what is beta times beta prime? And what do you get? You get like a z times all of these guys. So it's like a z cubed plus z to the 9 plus z to the minus 1 plus z to the minus 7. And then you do z to the 4th times all of these. So it's z to the 6th plus z to the 12th plus z squared plus z to the minus for, okay, I'm getting tired of doing this. You do it for the last two terms as well. And something remarkable happens. How many terms do you have? There's four of these each time by four of those, so you get 16 terms. And it turns out they're all distinct. Where you actually get something equivalent to just z plus z squared plus z cubed all the way through z to the 16th, which we know is just minus one. And so this is really, your beta times beta prime is really just minus one. Okay, we can actually find what your, what your beta is. Since beta is a root of this, we can just ask what are the roots of this guy? So we're just trying to find now the roots of x squared minus gamma x minus one. But I know roots of that will just be of the form. My x will just be negative b, so gamma, plus or minus the square root of gamma squared plus 4 all over 2. Yep. And then again, we can think, okay, there's really two solutions there. So, so this is your solution. So this is my beta and my beta prime. And we can ask which one is beta, which one is beta prime. But maybe first I've simplified this a little bit. I mean, I know what gamma is. We actually found gamma over here. We found gamma to be negative 1 plus root 17 over 2. So you can plug that in. And what do we get? Plugging in negative 1 plus root 17. Let, let me make this over 4 on bottom. So it's negative 1 plus the square root of 17 plus square your gamma. What happens when I square your gamma? It becomes 1 plus 17, so that's 18, minus 2 root 17. Yeah, 18 minus 2 root 17. So it's 18 minus 2 root 17 all over 4 plus this 4. Well, I can multiply that 4 by 4 to make it plus 16, put it all over 4, and then you pull that 4 out as 2, and, and pulling it out as 1 half really justifies the 4 on bottom, right? Okay. 
So you have this, which you can rewrite 18 and 16 is 34. It's really 34 minus 2 root 17. So, so we're starting to see, we're kind of building up to this, right? We're starting to build up to this. That's my beta and my beta prime. Okay, it still takes a little bit of thought of what is the plus and what is the minus. But again, you can just do like an analysis of which one is positive, which one is negative, and you can see that your beta corresponds with the, the positive case. So, so I've just shown then that my beta is secretly minus one plus root 17 plus the square root of 34 minus two root 17 all over four. And that is clearly a degree to extension of Q extended by just root 17. Because I had my, you know, here this is all just in Q extended by root 17, but now I have to take a square root of something that was in there. So, okay, one more step in our, in our construction. Great. Quick observation. If you just have the square root of 34 minus 2 root 17, you can square it to get just 34 minus 2 root 17. So if you're working in Q, from the square root of 34 minus 2 root 17, you can actually just recover root 17. So what I'm saying is that Q extended by just this piece is the same as Q extended by all of it. So you can think of this Q extended by beta as Q extended by all of that, but it comes out of equivalent to just Q extended by the square root of 34 minus the square root, uh, two square roots of 17. Okay. So then we're down to, you know, we've done these two, how do you do the last one? So, so I guess we won't do it out for lack of time, but, you know, I think the process should be pretty clear right now. You want to show that alpha, so, so you have your alpha, I have my alpha, and I want to show alpha is a root of a quadratic, quadratic with coefficients in Q extended by beta, which is the same thing as Q extended by the square root of 34 minus 2 root 17. Right? And so, and so this is the game that, that you play, and so you define some alpha prime, and then you just do alpha um, x minus alpha times x minus alpha prime will give you something of this form, x squared minus alpha plus alpha prime x plus alpha times alpha prime. And so then you have to be careful. It's like, well, I should be choosing my alpha prime in such a way that this value and this value comes out to be in here. So, so you can play around with that and see if you can finish the last step of Gauss's proof. Stop there today.